don't have to get quiet just yet, but I love that I can command the audience that way. <laughs> I love that. But I do need you to make your way to your seats, please. And if you're just coming in, come on up to the front. Don't be afraid. This is not a, not a lecture class. Come on up. <laughs> I still have one minute and two seconds. <laughs> and so do you. And, and so do you. Wow. I didn't know how cool this was up here. Come on in, take your time. You still have 45 seconds. <laughs> we will start on time, however. I'll do a little advance warning. Did everyone get their card for your question? Yeah. All right, excellent. I know. All right. <laughs> Hello, and welcome back to the 38th Annual Meeting of Philanthropy New York. My name is Yvonne Moore, and I am the Principal Philanthropic Advisor at Moore Philanthropy and the Vice Chair of the Board at Philanthropy New York. And it's my honor to introduce and welcome the panelists for our final portion of our program. We've already heard many ideas about how to increase and deepen public participation in our democratic process, and we're going to even hear even more, over the even more ideas over the next hour. But today is not the end of the conversation for Philanthropy New York. As we have with previous annual meetings, we hope today will simply be a jumping off point for additional programming on this subject over the course of the next year and beyond. Several members have already suggested follow-up discussions, including a deeper examination of the legislation passed by the New York State, State, uh, the New York State Assembly, which ironically has not, um, hasn't yet been taken up in the Senate, that would bring early voting, automatic registration, and electronic poll books to New York State. Philanthropy is also looking at how it could, how it is, and how it could support efforts to ensure the quality of the 2020 census, the quality and the reach of the 2020 census. We talked a little bit about this morning about how participation actually happens. And so I hope that we will actually embrace some of those, some of that feedback that was given to the fact that participation can't take place right before an election. It needs to be ongoing and happening all the time. And finally, how funders are investing in local journalism to give way to communities telling their own stories. As members of Philanthropy New York, we welcome your ideas about the issues we should be exploring. And I personally encourage you to consider taking up an active part and become a member of a committee or a network. Before I introduce our final panel, The Power of Participation, a few programming notes. Following this panel, our president, Ronna Brown, will return to the stage and bring us to a formal close. During the final conversation, we would like to give you an opportunity to ask questions. However, to keep it manageable, we'll be taking your questions on index cards. If you haven't gotten a card, looks like Catherine's telling me that everybody's got a card. If you don't have one, just raise your hand and they'll make sure that you get it. Um, we'll start collecting those ca cards about 30. We've got some hands up over here. We'll start collecting those cards about 30 minutes into the conversation. Raise your hands high, and they'll make sure you get a card. She's on her way back in with some cards. We'll start collecting those about 30 minutes into the conversation. Now, I'm going to give you a suggestion. You can take it if you want to. <laughs> I suggest you keep it short and legible. <laughs> okay? Don't get mad if your question is not asked and no one could read your penmanship. And also take a hint from the size of the card. Question. Now, get your hand up there, back with the cards. Hold your hand up really, really high for us. Excellent. Now, fun stuff. I'm very truly honored to welcome our distinguished panel to the stage. You all can begin making your way on up, Radhika. That's fine. I know they say I'm bossy. I'm sorry. That's. Go ahead. Yes. Yes. First, we welcome Amy Goodman. Amy is the host and executive producer of Democracy Now! 
the global daily independent news program airing on over 1,400 public television stations and radio stations worldwide. She became the news herself this past year with her extraordinary on-site coverage at Standing Rock. She is the winner of numerous awards and recognitions in journalism and is the author of six New York Times bestsellers, the latest being Democracy Now!, 20 years covering the movements changing America. Next to Amy is Chris Hayes. Chris is the Emmy Award winning. Chris is the Emmy Award winning host of All In with Chris Hayes on MSNBC, an editor at large at The Nation, and author of the 2012 book Twilight of the Elite: America's America After Meritocracy. His new book, A Colony in a Nation, released in March, puts forth that while America likes to tell itself that it inhabits a post-racial world, every empirical measure, which we love, all right, every empirical measure, including wealth, unemployment, incarceration, and school segregation reveals that racial inequality in our country hasn't improved since 1968. And last, but by no means least, our panel moderator is Radhika Jones. Radhika, exactly. Radhika is the editorial director of books at the New York Times and a former deputy director at Time Magazine, where she was charged with editing two of the publication's most famous issues, Person of the Year and Time's most 100, Time 100's Most Influential People. Radhika, after our thanks, I'll turn it over to you. Please join me once again in welcoming our esteemed panel. Good morning. Uh, is the mic, the mic is working. I think the mic is working. Okay, great. Um, well, uh, we have a lot to discuss, um, and, and uh, I, we wanted to start by giving our panelists a chance to kind of let you know a little bit about where they're coming from on these issues of democracy building um, and civic engagement. So, um, you know, in, in terms of the themes of the day, voting access, um, the abilities and opportunities for people to engage um, in the democratic process, and significantly for all of us on this stage, I think that the issues around the quality of information that people are receiving um, that can help them along the path to that participation. Chris, do you want to talk a little bit about sort of where, what's primary in your mind when you think about these issues? Sure, yeah, I think, um, so I think there's a few major trends that are happening that, that are um, the sort of structural landscape of, of civic participation, democracy building. Um, one I would say, and, and in some ways the most elemental, is just the structural uh, polarization of the country. Uh, the polarization is, um, there, there's a big debate about the degree to which it's cause and effect, right? Is it that elites are polarized and they send signals to voters to be polarized? Is it that it's actually a genuine sort of self-sorting that's happening? There's interesting data in both directions uh, about the degree to which that kind of polarization is a thing that's happening organically on the ground and how much it's being sort of led from above. But as a sort of structural fact about American politics, it's a really key and important one. Um, American politics, at some level, I would say that multi-ethnic and pluralist democratic politics are always tribal to a certain extent, but I think American politics are growing more and more so uh, in ways that are worrying uh, and, and probably destructive uh, in a lot of ways. So that's one sort of huge factor that you encounter at all different levels. Um, that relates to a second factor, which is to the extent that that polarization is happening, and it's happening in these very, very specific demographic terms, you've created a whole set of perverse incentives around participation. Um, it, you know, the, the whole idea of a secret ballot box, right, is that you don't know whether the person whose door you knock on is what, who they're gonna vote for and what their politics are. But the nature of Americans, uh, American political coalitions and also data and technology means that you can basically predict pretty well uh, if you give someone some data about who that person's gonna vote for, which of the, the two major coalitions they associate with. And because of that, it then produces the incentives to uh, take steps to disempower uh, the other group. And I think this has largely been, at the risk of sounding partisan, asymmetrical. I think that um, the Republicans and conservatives have largely recognized that they have an opportunity, um, often driven by 
by race um, to essentially erect bars to democratic participation, whether through gerrymandering, everyone should look at that North Carolina map, which is insane. Um, they keep getting struck down, North Carolina and Texas, et cetera, or through voter IDs or other just sort of what we might call the kind of um, the a sort of avalanche of hassle uh, that that you can put small obstacles in people's way. I mean, I, I had the experience here in New York City um, of just trying to vote. I thought I was gonna be away for election day and then I wasn't and I had to go through like a hundred different steps to like get the absentee ballot and then maybe cancel it and go vote. And New York, by the way, is a d d disaster as all of you know, it's, it's, it's an embarrassment. Um, it is, and I think actually New York is a great counterexample to a vision of this that's entirely partisan. New York is obviously um, a solidly uh, blue state. Uh, New York City politics are solidly uh, within the power of the Democratic Party. And yet there's an interest on the behalf of incumbent powers to not have a lot of people vote. Um, it is, the whole system is designed to create very low turnout elections in which organized interests can have high leverage in the turnout in those elections. Um, and this has been produced by a lot of um, institutions that you know we normally think of, or I normally think of as sort of being associated with more, more enfranchised and particularly public unions that have a, 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 an interest in keeping turnout low uh, because <coughs> it allows them greater leverage. So it's not purely a kind of, it's not purely partisan, um, but it is, it is in some ways, an out, the sophistication by which people can uh, employ these tools of suppression and hassle is an outgrowth of the the lines around polarization that have grown so stark, right? So if every voter you can tell in the dark by their address, by their education level, by their race, by their demographic information, like which coalition they're in, you could do all kinds of things to try to create structural barriers for the other group and, and enhance your own. And we've seen this put, uh, put to use. The third factor I would say is uh, what I would call the nationalization of American politics, which I think is a really important and fascinating phenomenon and, and, and an under-recognized one. Um, the nationalization of American politics is, I think, lar largely born out, out of the hollowing out of local media. The entire business model for huge swaths, it's like, it's a little like a, it's like an ecosystem that had an invasive species come and just like take out a huge middle part of the ecosystem, right? So the, the invasive species in this case being essentially the sort of uh, the internet and, and, and Craigslist and the collapse of local advertising revenue. And it just came and it just, ate through an entire part of the media ecosystem, which was essentially local coverage, built frankly off local newspapers that had things like um, state reporters in Capitol Hill and things like that. That's been largely eviscerated. And it's had two effects, I think. One is that the, the information that people have access to about local government has gotten very poor. Um, there are just fewer reporters. This is demonstrated empirically. There's all sorts of people who've done work on this. There are fewer state house reporters. There are fewer city ha hall reporters. There are fewer people going to school board meetings. All of the sort of basics of, of, of government reporting at the local level has just been totally eviscerated in the last 20 years. But I think another effect of that is that what you are seeing is because political media is increasingly national, it's creating this sort of reverb effect where as opposed to, it used to be the case that, you know, Texas politics were different in interesting ways than American politics. And actually what's happening in Texas is a perfect example. Texas for a very long time, obviously it's a very Republican state. Well, it was a very Democratic state, very Republican state, very conservative. But because of the distinct nature of Texas politics actually was um, not, did not have a sort of virulent anti-immigrant politics. And that's because of the legacy of, of you know, you've got nine, ninth generation Mexican Americans in Texas. You've got um, you've got a fair, fairly large um, caucus of Hispanic legislators in the Republican Party in Texas. So all of the kind of the sort of polarized demographic tribalism of American politics on this issue had largely not reached Texas. And in fact, this was a huge problem for Rick Perry when he ran in 2012, in which he had signed a bill that allowed uh, undocumented students in Texas to pay in-state tuition. A sort of Micro Dream Act. We got absolutely destroyed by it by Mitt Romney. Actually, we should note um, who beat him over the head with it. That's all changing now in Texas. This latest legislative session in Texas, all of the the kind of um, nastiness of, um, of of the national politics on immigration, particularly among the right, has now been imported back into a state that has more experience directly on the ground with this than the folks in Iowa or New Hampshire 
where these issues are playing very well. It's a very bizarre thing. So here you have a state that has organically experienced immigration and come to a set of policies that, while to my mind aren't ideal, are a kind of interesting, pragmatic crafting around what the actual exigencies are. And that is now being replaced with the most sort of like sloganeering, simple binaries of American political discourse about immigrants imported back into a place that actually knows better. And that to me is, is a perfect example of the ways in which the sort of politics of the country have been nationalized, right? So everything now sort of runs through the national political dialogue back into local places, which is sort of the opposite of how we fundamentally want a kind of federalist system to work, right? The whole idea between of laboratories in the states, et cetera, and local governance is that, you know, the people, what's the Dewey line? Like the, um, the man who wears the shoes knows where the hole is, right? Like the, the, the idea is that you want citizens on the ground, legislators on the ground to be encountering first person what their problems are, coming to solutions, and that's sort of working its way up. And in fact, it's happening the opposite now. So you've got this crazy nationalization of politics, and all of this is sort of run through the same polarization mechanism in all three of the sort of structural things I'm identifying. And I think it's creating tremendous dysfunctions. The last thing I'll say about participation is the weird uh, byproduct of this from a participation standpoint and sort of the vibrancy of civil society is this kind of pendulum swinging of activism, right? So people only get activated when they feel like the other team is in power, right? So when the other team's in power, it's like I am now and, and it's dangerous, I think, actually, in terms of a legitimacy question, right? Like the whole the whole thing this all rests on, right, is the idea that there are nonviolent means of redressing grievance through representative politics and that no one has a total hold on power when the other side is in power. That's like the basics of keeping a kind of liberal democracy together. Increasingly, people feel like they are fundamentally disenfranchised and out of power when the other side controls it. What you do see as a kind of benefit of that is a surge of civic engagement, and that's been largely salutary in a lot of ways. Um, and I say this on both sides. I mean, like the Tea Party activism in 2010, like people get activated, they show up meetings, they talk to their congressmen, they contact them, but it only happens in the context when the pendulum's on the other side. And there's something I think kind of structurally dangerous about that. Amy, activism seems like a good point for you to p pick up on. Um, well, I thought I would just tell a story to start off, uh, talk about the standoff at Standing Rock and how important it is to have a media that provides a forum for people to speak for themselves. I mean, whether we're talking about a Palestinian child or an Israeli grandmother, a native elder from Standing Rock Sioux Tribe in North Dakota or an uncle in Afghanistan, to hear someone describing their own experience, there's nothing more powerful, framing their own story. I mean, you don't have to agree with it. How often do we even agree with our family members? But you begin to understand where they're coming from. And that understanding is the beginning of peace. I think the media can be the greatest force for peace on earth. Instead, all too often, it's wielded as a weapon of war. And that's why I think we have to take the media back. I, I see the media as a huge kitchen table that stretches across the globe that we all sit around and debate and discuss the most important issues of the day. Um, war and peace, life and death, and anything less than that is a disservice to the servicemen and women of this country who can't have these debates on military bases. They rely on us and civilian society to have the discussions that lead to the decisions about whether they live or die, whether they're sent to kill or be killed. Um, anything less than that is a disservice to a democratic society. So Democracy Now! we started 21 years ago on nine community radio stations. We're gonna wrap up after it was an election year, the only election program and public broadcasting daily show then. Uh, President Clinton was reelected that year. We're going to wrap up the next day. And um, there was more <coughs> demand for our show after the election than before because we looked at the primaries as a way to look at what people were doing in their states, in their communities. At the time, most people didn't vote. I didn't think it was about apathy. I thought, well, what are they doing in their communities? How are they engaged? Let them describe what they're doing. And that, you know, that provides a kind of excitement when you hear people, not the typical pundits, but people describing their own experiences. 
So that was 96, and we, nine stations, and then we started on television the week of the September 11th attacks by chance as emergency broadcasting, because we were the closest national broadcast to Ground Zero. We broadcast of a, out of an old media, old firehouse near Ground Zero that became a media center. And once we started on TV, more and more stations took us, and now we're on these 1,400 stations, public television and radio. We just went on about 10 more PBS stations across the country as part of um, a native news channel. Um, and this goes to our coverage of Standing Rock. But for those of you who are following this, you may know this, and I just came off of Democracy Now! today. We do the show every morning, 8 to 9, and I was interviewing um, the 45th chairman of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, Dave Archambo, who most of you may have heard of, 45th chairman, like, you know, Donald Trump is the 45th president of the United States, <laughs> at least for now. Um, um, and this chapter of the struggle began April 1st, oh, just over a year ago. Um, uh, the unofficial historian of the Standing Rock Sioux, LaDonna Brave Bull Allard, uh, opened up her property along the Cannonball River in North Dakota. She's a descendant of Sitting Bull um, to the resistance, the resistance to the $3.8 billion Dakota Access Pipeline. They call it the Native Americans the black snake that snakes its way from the taking fracked oil from the back and oil fields of North Dakota through South Dakota, um, Indiana, Illinois, and will hook up with a pipeline to the Gulf of Mexico. And the Native Americans said no. Now, they weren't alone. I mean, the people of Bismarck, North Dakota, said no. And uh, the people of Mandan, North Dakota, they didn't want it either. Um, the difference for the Native Americans is they weren't so lucky. Energy Transfer Partners, which owns the Dakota Access Pipeline, um, decided to place it right near uh, their uh, reservation. And this resistance just kept growing. First tens of people, then hundreds, then thousands. They had to open up more resistance camps. There was the Red Warrior Camp and others. It was the largest unification of Native American tribes we have seen in this country in decades, from Latin America, from the United States, the First Nations, from Canada. And this is growing through when? 2016, the election year. In the time of the general elections, the journalists who moderated the debates on television they never asked a question about climate change, let alone the Dakota Access Pipeline. Not a question. Yet on the ground in this country, the level of resistance that was building, not only among Native Americans, but also their non-Native allies, saying we have to find a way to develop a sustainable <coughs> economy um, uh, for this planet. It can't be based on fossil fuels. And Native Americans didn't see themselves as just doing this for themselves. They didn't see themselves as protesters, but water protectors. Um, you know, the pipeline would go under the Missouri River, the longest river in North America, and they felt that it endangered 17 million people downstream. So they resisted. And we went Labor Day weekend. Even that was late. We were covering it before, but weren't on the ground until that weekend. And what we saw was just astounding. I mean, you would see people marching down these back prairie roads of North Dakota, hundreds of people led by native elders, often women. They'd start with a water ceremony that have glasses of water. Um, and then they would confront a fully militarized sheriff's department. I mean, they had uh, MRAPs, they had tanks, they had rubber bullets, they had automatic weapons. They would hold these glasses of water, the Native Americans, and they would say, this is for you, not just for us. This is for your children, not just ours. Now, you've seen this image of the militarized police departments because of Ferguson. Um, and, you know, you have these local police departments. This is recycling in America today. You take the military hardware from Afghanistan and Iraq, and you give it to the police departments of the United States. And it's no surprise they view everyone around them, even if they're their neighbors, as the enemy when you're looking you know, through um, uh, the crosshairs. We had Norm Stamper on a little while ago, the former police chief of Seattle, who was driven out um, after the um, Battle of Seattle, you know, the, all the major protests against the World Trade Organization in 1999. I mean, he, his police department hit the protesters back in 1999, high school kids, librarians, teachers, doctors, nurses, farmers from around the world, with so much tear gas, they had to go to other states to get more. And we just had 
Norm Stemper, and he was ousted afterwards, as he should have been, but he said that was the worst mistake of his life, what he did. He said, when we have that much military and paramilitary equipment, he said, I, we just forgot these are our kids. Many high schoolers were arrested. These are environmentalists, the nurses, the doctors. These are our community. And we did see them as the enemy, he said. And we're seeing the same thing play, play out in these uh, major actions that are taking place. So we covered the protests. And then on Saturday of Labor Day weekend, we're following some Native Americans who were going to plant their tribal flags in an area they had said was their sacred burial ground. A judge had said, if you say it's sacred, prove it to me. Show me a map where the burial mounds are. And they made a map. Um, this is right before Labor Day weekend. And then the judge gave it to the Dakota Access Pipeline. And when the Native Americans came up on this property, they saw the um, bulldozers operating at full tilt. They were shocked. They thought it was a holiday. They weren't going to be doing it. But also, it was the very property they designated. And the bulldozers had been way down the road. And they felt they had taken this map that they had provided and leapfrogged forward and actually were destroying what they designated so that when the judge would rule the next week, it would, you know, the facts would change on the ground. It would be a moot point. So they were furious. And they came up on the property, kids, women, men, elders, boys, um, soon hundreds of people, and they were demanding the bulldozers move back. These are incredibly brave acts to see a woman holding the hand of a child, because these are massive machines, these bulldozers, churning the earth. But they did succeed in pushing them back. Um, and then the Dakota Access Pipeline guards unleashed attack dogs on the Native Americans. Dogs. And they were biting the Native Americans. You'd even see the dogs sometimes pull back and they'd throw them into the crowd. They'd bite their way out. We were interviewing people who were bitten, who were bleeding. Uh, we showed a the video of a dog with its mouth and nose dripping with blood. Ultimately that day, the people bloodied, beaten, maced, bitten, did succeed in pushing everyone back and the guards would leave in their pickup trucks. But they had prevailed. We took this video, we posted it online that night on Facebook, and within 24, 48 hours, there was something like 14 million views. <coughs> Even for the corporate media, this was a massive response and it really showed them. If you ask them, you know, why don't you cover these issues? You don't raise it once in a debate. And they would say, well, we give the people what they want, you know, if th that's not the kind of thing they're interested in. And this just shows the lie. That number was big for anyone. So we went back to New York, and we continued to cover this. And the judge was going to rule the following Friday. On Thursday, Governor Dalrymple, the governor of North Dakota at the time, um, called out the National Guard. It didn't look good for the tribe. The judge would be ruling the next day, that Friday. And they also quietly issued an arrest warrant for me. Now, I didn't know this at the time. Um, so Friday we did our show, and then we headed up to Canada. I wasn't fleeing, but it was the <laughs> Toronto International Film Festival, and they were doing a film on um, I.F. Stone, the great muckraking journalist who taught students, if you're going to remember two words, remember governments lie. If you can remember three words, remember all governments lie. So, and then they were showing um, independent media today. So it was showing Democracy Now!, um, Matt Taibbi at Rolling Stone. So Matt came up to the film festival. And we spoke that night and the next day at University of Toronto. And in the middle of my talk, I looked down and I just gotten a text that said, you're under arrest. So I thought this was like spam or something. Um, it said like there's an arrest warrant out for you. But then I did see it was a North Dakota number and so I thought, okay, I'm in trouble because I'm in Canada. You don't get arrested immediately, but if you deal with police, FBI, or border guards and the arrest warrants in the system, then they'll take you. So I have to get back over the border. So in the middle of the talk, I just said, could someone call me a cab, please? <laughs> and I raced to the airport, came back. I didn't take the arrest warrant personally um, because I thought it was, a warning to all journalists, do not come to North Dakota. And I thought it was particularly critical to fight this for young journalists who don't have the resources or the institutional support to end up in jail when they try to cover one of these epic struggles of our lifetime. And so, you know, I thought I'd call their bluff. They had no reason to call for my arrest. So we flew back to North Dakota a few weeks later in October. And as we landed on that Friday in October, um, 
the prosecutor announced he was dropping the charges against me, but he would bring more serious charges of riot, and um, I could face a year in jail. So, I mean, what, I'm a one-woman riot? What was he possibly talking about? So I call my North Dakota lawyer, not that I had had one before, and I said, well, what's going to happen here? And so he said, you're going to be arraigned on Monday at 1.30, which gave us two and a half days to cover the protests, which we did. Um, and I said, well, what happens? Does anyone intervene before this arraignment? He said, no, it's absolutely automatic. The judge just rubber stamps it. Then they use their discretion after the um, arraignment. He said, no, 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 that's what separates judges from us mere mortals. He has to decide to sign off on this. He said, it doesn't work like that. Well, we put out a press release and we named the judge and said he would be making this decision about whether I would be arraigned, whether uh, these charges would stand. We covered the protests over the weekend. On Monday morning, the show must go on, so we brought up a broadcast truck from Minneapolis. We broadcast in Mandan in front of the courthouse and the jail so that I could turn myself in afterwards. So the backdrop was the courthouse, the jail, and the Ten Commandments in between. <laughs> and um, it was 7 a.m. North Dakota time, and I interviewed um, Dave Archambault, the chairman of the tribe, said, have you ever been arrested? He said, yes. He, it was his first arrest a few months before um, for protesting the pipeline. He had got mi low-level misdemeanor. And I said, what happened? He said, oh, I strip searched, put in an orange jumpsuit, and I was jailed. I asked Dr. Sarah Jumping Eagle, the pediatrician of the tribe, uh, who cares about the children's health. She had been one of the first to be arrested. What happened? Strip searched, orange jumpsuit, and um, jailed. I mean, the humiliation of these people. It's just astounding how much can they take. At the airport one time in Bismarck, I bumped into a guy who said, don't think I don't know who you are. I said, oh, well, who are you? And he said, I'm one of the guards that was on the site that day. Um, and I said, did you unleash the attack dogs? And he said, no. We didn't know that was going to happen. Uh, Dakota Access Pipeline had hired several different security guards at uh, companies. We were as surprised as anyone. Hmm. He said, you don't think I get it? We sick dogs on them after we've massacred them for hundreds of years. He said, I know why they're angry at us. You know, you never assume a person's position based on the position that they have. And to bring out all of these voices is absolutely critical. We interviewed on the day of the dogs, Winona LaDuke of the White Earth Reservation, northern Minnesota. She said, Governor Dalrymple, you are not George Wallace. This is not Alabama 1965. We are through. Um, President Obama was in Asia the week of, uh, right after Labor Day, before the judge ruled against the tribe. And he was asked at a democracy forum for young students, Asian students from around the region who'd come to Laos, the first trip of President Obama to Laos, teaching them about democracy. The young woman at the end raised her hand from Malaysia and she says, Governor, uh, President Obama, what about the Dakota Access Pipeline? She had asked a question of President Obama that no journalist mm. had publicly asked President Obama in this entire year. And he held forth, was eloquent about the oppression of Native Americans, but then when it came to DAPL, um, he said, I'd have to get back to my team. He came back, he reportedly saw the video of the dogs, and when the judge ruled against the tribe that Friday after Labor Day when we had gone to Canada, a few minutes later, an unprecedented three-agency letter was released, Justice Department, Army Corps of Engineer, and Interior saying they would slow down on the pipeline and really see if Native Americans had the proper input and if there was an environmental impact statement. So back to the, that week, that day of being arraigned, after the show, more and more Native Americans came to where we were broadcasting, across the street from the courthouse, to perform ceremonies, show solidarity. Riot police were lining up. It was getting extremely serious. And just as, as I was about to go across the street for my arraignment, um, I got a call from North Dakota Public Radio. I mean, everyone was now covering this, but he said, you know, he knew all the players, been there for decades, said the judge will not sign off. And this was a first, <laughs> will not sign off on the charges. You're not going to be arraigned. And it was not only me. The Native Americans who faced felonies and misdemeanors that day, a number of them had their charges dropped. And this just shows, I mean, the Times was covering it, the Los Angeles Times, Washington Post, the homepage of BBC, a journalist is being arraigned, Vogue magazine was covering this. When the media spotlight is shining in the right direction, 
what a difference it can make. Um, you know, I'm all for reality television, not the kind that President, Obama, President Trump stars in, but the kind that actually shows the reality of people's lives on the ground, the dignity of providing a forum for people to speak for themselves. That was October, December 5th, President Obama, they issued another three agency letter. They were going to reroute the pipeline or slow it down further. And then President Trump took office and one of his first acts in office was to uh, grant the permit to drill under the Missouri River and to move forward not only on DAPL, the Dakota Access Pipeline, but also he said on Keystone Excel. And last week, speaking before a rally, he said, I did it with my eyes closed. And that's what we played for uh, Chairman Archambault today to say, what did you think of that? Um, now, interestingly, the end of the story, um, the mass protests that have happened along the way, the People's Climate March in Washington on April 29th, the week before the March for Science, all around climate change, many Native Americans involved with this the level of engagement now of the Native American community and many others in any place, like when I asked you if you knew about this story, any place I go, it is astounding how many people know about the standoff, and it is not because of the corporate media. And this is very, very important. Indigenous media first and foremost, and independent media, not brought to you by the oil companies when we cover climate change, not brought to you by the weapons manufacturers when we cover war and peace, not brought to you by the insurance industry and big pharma when we cover healthcare, but independently brought to you by listeners, viewers, and readers who are hungry for independent views. So last week, although the pipeline has been built and according to energy transfer partners, the oil is flowing, Judge Boasberg, who ruled against the tribe in September, just ruled that he will take up the case of the pipeline, decide whether or not based on hearings next week of both sides, Native Americans have had the proper impact whether when Trump made this decision, a proper environmental impact statement had been done and will decide whether to shut it down. Meanwhile, the Standing Rock Sioux are starting to build solar and wind farms right next to the pipeline to show what an alternative um, can look like. And it has been an ed education to people in this country and around the world. You know, now, Media knows no borders. It is truly global. And people are intensely interested in a way I have not seen before because this involves all of us. Uh, you know, taking on the issue of climate change involves the fate of the planet. And no matter what our current administration says about climate change, the reason there's this universal response from conservative governments to progressive ones around the world is obviously they know the facts, they know the truth about climate change. So let's talk about the media environment because it, there are a lot of overlaying complications and some of the points that you both raised. You know, Chris, you talked about the death of, of local reporting, which contributes to the atmosphere that we live in um, of distrust for the national media. And totally. it's, it's very much because, you know, there's no more local paper reporter at the ball game or at the court hearing, you know, people aren't seeing reporters doing their jobs day to day and interacting with the communi community the way they used to. So, so it plays in, the death of local reporting plays into that general distrust of the media as a as an institution. Um, at the same time, you have this impulse of the media to tell to be a platform for individual stories, um, but that's playing into an incredibly polarized media environment in which literally the news is different depending on which channel you watch or importantly, which social media feeds you're watching. Um, and I think the, you know, the, the lack of trust in institutional media and the rise of social media and the kind of increase in the, in the polarization of social media where you have your feed, you have your Facebook friends, you have your bubble and you're hearing what you think is news and on the other side of the political divide, the, the news is completely different. You know, how in that climate with all of these different forces pulling at us um, and pulling at our attention, are there ways of improving the, very simply the way that Americans are informed? 
I mean, I don't know. I, I maybe I'm. I don't mean to be uh, pessimistic. I think that. I mean, I guess well, here's one thing I would say. Like we we tend to talk about some golden age of media, um, which was really like anomalous, right? So the kind of idea of the three broadcast networks and and big papers was the product of a bunch of uh, market forces in terms of consolidation and monopoly that allowed there to be, you know, this huge audiences on very limited number of uh, outlets, right? My, my favorite example of this is that Tiny Tim's Wedding on The Tonight Show had 45 million viewers. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> 45 million people watch Tiny Tim get married at 11.30 at night? Yeah, and, and when you say, well, why? It's like, because there was nothing else on. <laughs> There's like three, you know. <coughs> so, but there was a degree to which the, the, the fact that you had this very small number of outlets meant that the, the sort of, to, to Amy's point about the kitchen table, right? Like the kitchen table was, in some senses, particularly the national level, like it, that was very clearly defined, right? Like everyone's interacting through this same set of mediated experiences. And, you know, there's a way to glorify that, which is that I think it produced a kind of like national conversation in a way, but also it was terrible in a lot of ways because the editorial decisions had incredible amounts of power for huge amounts of communities that were not represented or reflected at all in the coverage in the newsrooms, et cetera. So there's this trade-off that's happening, right? So the death of that, the sort of proliferation of different avenues, um, you know, creates this sort of extremely both um, ecstatic and exuberant set of new forms and also more balkanization. I think that the one thing I think to focus on when you think about this is, is how these enterprises are structured. So I think democracy now is a great example where, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but Democracy now has a is is creating a, a media that people contribute to because of the totality of it, which is to say, like they're not making they you guys are not like getting up every morning and be like, oh, we we had this many views yesterday, we have to deal with this many views today. There's a sort of capital buy-in, like in the in the in the reputational capital of the product, <coughs> of the not the product, but of the of the experience of what it's doing, right, and. The, 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 the sort of really deleterious set of incentives that now expands across all media and even small independent independent media is this sort of attentional incentive, which is clicks, views, ratings. And that's true for me, right? Because I have to, every day at 4.15, there's a spreadsheet that gets mailed out to my entire company saying what we did by quarter hours across all four networks, right? So I get a grade every day in 15 minute increments for my work the previous day that everyone sees every day. Wow. And that number is the most important thing in my performance. Um, so that's, that is, when you talk about the corporate media, like that's literally 1000 times more important than advertisers. I literally have no idea who my advertisers are. I've never talked to them. I have no idea. What I do know is how the first block performed yesterday. <laughs> what grabbed people's attention? Like I, I literally have no idea who advertised on my show, but I do know what rated and what didn't, and I do know that if we did that block on Syria and it dipped fifty thousand viewers, like, eh, right? So now think about that, right? Those incentives have now cascaded downward, right? Because if you're running a YouTube channel as an independent content producer, you now are seeing that every day. You know what, uh, what gets clicks and what doesn't, and I have watched that those sets of incentives shape the contours of in, even independent media, because people are, the, 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 the metrics are incredibly close to people. And so there is this incentive to sort of get people's attention. When we think about, this is, you know, when we think about tabloid media, right? Tabloid is this pejorative term. All it refers to is a format, right? It's not the broadsheet, it's the tabloid. And when we think about tabloid is, why, was ta why is tabloid media tabloid? Why is tabloid media in the UK tabloid? because it's competitive, right? Why are supermarket checkout counter magazines so salacious? Because they are competitive, because there are five of them and each of them is trying to get your attention. So there's a relationship between this kind of sense of market competition and all of the incentives that we called salacious and tabloid, right? So what a huge part of the project is to erect robust structures. Democracy Now! is a great example of them. Local NPR is also a great example that are 
insulated. It's not just from advertisers, right? But you can get rid of advertisers and still be in this tabloid mode because you still need to get clicks for the video that you put up on YouTube. The key thing is to get media models <coughs> at every level, national level, local level. And the problem is it's harder to sustain at the local level, right? So democracy now has this huge global reach, the pool of people to which it can talk to. But if you wanted to do, the, do that for Boise, right? Like you've got a smaller amount of people in Boise that are gonna give you contributions to buy into this project. But that's really to me the challenge is produce media models that are not live or die by attention day after day, that they're bought into as an enduring project that's gonna make editorial decisions that some days you might click over to and be like, ah, I'm not interested in reading about that. But they, they have the latitude to do that because the project as a whole is a project that people have bought into. What do you do about people who just refuse to engage at all? I mean, part of the lesson of the Tiny Tim uh, viewership is not just that there was nothing else on, but there was little else to do. And, and you know, something that I've thought a lot about in, in the various media institutions where I've worked is our competition, you know, it's not just those other media organizations. It's Candy Crush on your iPhone. It's, you know, it's, it's your Instagram feed. It's, I mean, there are literally so many things that can take away people's attention, particularly at a time where politics, wherever you fall, can feel demoralizing, depressing, stagnant, you know, harmful at, at worst. What do you think? Amy? I mean, I don't think we have the problem of people not being engaged now. Um, even if the politics are so difficult, I think there is a level of heightened attention now like we have n never seen before. And people are intensely interested. And it's trying to go beyond, and I know Chris does this too, go beyond the pundits you get on television who know so little about so much explaining <laughs> the world to us and getting it so wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, it is not a contradiction. Oh, you get on a local voice and no one's gonna listen, but it's sort of good for them, I wish they would. It's nothing like that. I mean, give this example. The networks thought, no, people wouldn't be interested in climate change, so we're not going to present this kind of information. And the interest is intense. And people are getting their information all different ways. You know, democracy now, just because of the mother, it's necessity is the mother of in, invention. From the beginning, we were 21 years ago online because it's the way we sent the radio, what they didn't have the word podcast then, but the way we, we had to send everything for free. And then we perfected a way to send broadcast quality video through the internet. So when the networks are paying millions to Saddam Hussein in Iraq uh, for use of the satellites, our colleague Jeremy Scahill and others were going into internet cafes using a special program that divided up our video broadcast into like 150 emails, go through <laughs> a screen, and then we would piece it back together in New York. When the thugs brought down the satellites in Egypt at the time of Tahrir, and you saw Anderson Cooper in his hotel room um, looking a little like the old democracy now on Skype, and the lower third was reporting from an undisclosed location, we had Sharif Abdul Qaddus in Tahrir Square saying his name where he was um, and saying this is the safest place to be because our videographer with, with Sharif, who stayed there for those 18 days, went back, sent that 25-minute uh, video of the people making this revolution from the high school kids standing in the shadow of the state media building that had spewed lies for so many decades, to Hadef Suef, the great Egyptian writer who wrote Map of Love, who was standing next to two very pregnant women who said they won't give birth until Mubarak falls, um, <laughs> to Nawal Sadawi, who ran for president, was exiled, was imprisoned, and was telling the young people, even before this revolution, we will win, we will win. And you were meeting them all. What it looks like when a whole community a country engages in a revolution. Now, where that is today in Egypt is a whole other story. The crackdown this week in particular is intense. But uh, we would, those videos would be sent, we'd send them through the internet and broadcast them. And the hunger for all of this, I, you know, I think the media paved the way for what we have today. Um, for the president of the United States. I mean, we all have seen the studies from the Tyndall Report and others that Donald Trump, basically they rolled out the red carpet for any speech he gave, you know, 
And they showed the empty podium longer, the networks, waiting for him to speak and then would show that whole speech than they ever played of anything Bernie Sanders said. And when you might say, well, people are more interested and that's why we did it. I mean, you don't have to take it from independent journalists. Look at, right, the head of CBS said what we did was good for CBS and bad for America. But when you think about it, it was not only the rolling out the red carpet, the other candidates would have to go from state to state. He was you know, rolled into everyone's living room uninterrupted. But then the kind of decisions the networks made not to broadcast the alternative. On March 15th, the third, I think it was Super Tuesday 3, you had five states, Illinois and Missouri among them. All of the candidates' speeches were run in full, as they should have been. I think Rubio was there then, Cruz, Clinton, uh, uh, Trump. Um, they never even played Bernie Sanders' speech, not one second, or speculated where he was. In fact, he was speaking to the most people that night in Arizona, something like 8,000 people. So the next day, not that we planned to, but we said, okay, we'll do something that the networks, for some reason, have decided not to do, and play an excerpt of that speech. But when you look at what happened in that election, what happened with Bernie Sanders, who almost took the Democratic nomination with very little corporate media coverage, Forget what your views are on these candidates. The decisions that were made to silence some and broadcast uninterrupted others determined what happened in this country and what we're dealing with today. And we need a media that is challenged, that is independent, and does not do that again. I mean, I, 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 I disagree in some, some ways. Um, <laughs> I don't disagree about the sort of quantity of coverage. Um, well, let me say this. The, in the broad sense, right, so the idea that like people will watch climate change coverage or DAPL, right, that is an outgrowth you discover on the other side of the hill that you go over because you're not um, prisoner to the incentives of attention. Like, Democracy Now! covers Dapple not because they're like, I bet you there's a huge audience for this. It covers Dapple because like this is an important story to us or covers career for that reason. Now, you go and you do that from an editorial perspective, and then on the other side of the mountain, you find like, hey, look at this. People really do care about this. This is a, you know, the, so what ends up happening in the, in the sort of the risk aversion that happens, right, around attention is it's you try to stick with what works. It just becomes this sort of rain dance, right? So it's like, well, the Trump speech rated really well. And believe me, I mean, I know this as intimately as any human being on the planet. <laughs> I, I mean that quite honestly. Like, these numbers are like, I can recall to you these numbers, right? So I know it's like, well, the Trump speech rated really well on Tuesday, and now it's Wednesday. And the competitor went to it, and we didn't, and we got our butts kicked. So what are we going to do here? Now, again, the, the, these all these decisions that are being made, they're not... Amy, I think Amy is right to point out that they're not necessarily the correct ones, and often they're not. In fact, there grows up this folk wisdom in media organizations about what people do and don't want that often gets very detached from the data. But the data is what's driving people's sense of risk aversion. So what, what you need is, ultimately what you need is create the platforms for media or organizations that essentially are making editorial decisions first. I mean, that really is to me the key, right? Like, you, like what you want is to produce whatever the underlying funding structure is, okay? The Intercept's a great, a great example right now, right? The Intercept has all this money from the guy that sold eBay, right? And they could, they make editorial decisions about what they think is important. That's, that's what they think, that's what they do. But I'm saying I don't think that um, you have to make the decision, you know, you're not going to have the eyeballs on this, but you think it's important. I actually think they go together and you just, I mean. Right, but, I'm, but, but, but you don't, I think that, I, I, I know you believe that and I think that's true largely. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that the, what, I'm, what I'm describing is sort of sociological sense, right, is the institutional nature of how those incentives get calculated, right? So that may be true as an empirical matter, but people are still operating in frameworks where they're trying to they're trying to chase this attention. And the sense of what does and doesn't work for that has a profound effect institutionally in how people chase that attention, right? 
there are also. I'm not saying they're right. I'm just saying that 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 is the that ultimately ends up being the kind of like north star. And 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 it, again, it is a cargo pillar. It is it, it gets it to my endless um, frustration. It produces folkism, really, literally folkism. Like like literally, ah, that doesn't rate. It's folk wisdom. It's like you're, you know, it's like your your grandmother being like, oh, you catch a cold. It's like, well, I'm not gonna. What, where's the data on that, right? The the it produces folk wisdom that's born of this sort of idea of uh, get the eyeballs. And I do think, I genuinely think this. I think that the more competitive it's gotten, the more, in some ways, it drives towards risk aversion, right? So there's a relationship between the two, which is. If it's a really competitive space and there's nine different people, right, and as opposed to two or three, there's this sort of idea of like, oh, well, they're, they're going to do this thing. We need to sort of pre preemptively cut them off the pass. You would think in some ways, right, it should be the opposite, right? At some level, you have this intuitive idea that competition shouldn't lead to clustering. It should lead to the opposite, right? What competition should produce is that people say, I'm going to carve out this distinct beat. I'm going to carve out this distinct identity. I'm going to carve out this distinct brand. But what ends up happening often, and just this is like a sociologically descriptive account, not a normative one, um, is that you, you get clustering out of this weird sort of um, uh, insecurity, risk aversion that someone's going to beat you to this thing. Mm -hmm. There also, we were talking before, um, before we got started about you were telling the story of how difficult it is at the moment to cover the uh, health care bill yeah. in the Senate. Mm -hmm. um, because even though it's something that everybody has a vested interest in, there's literally nothing to say about it because it's being done in secret. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't give you daily developments, right? So, so the news is that a sixth of the economy is being restructured behind closed doors by 13 men. And not even those 13 men, because like yesterday, a few of them are on the record being, oh, I don't know what's in it. <laughs> Which, like, honestly, I think is a lie. I think they're actually just not being truthful about it. I think they, but it's it's the you know it's the uh, it's it's been a very effective uh, mechanism to keep this thing under lock and key. Now the news is that it's secret, right? But it was hilarious to watch the four Democratic senators had a press conference yesterday where they talked about it, and they were they were talking about the Medicaid cuts, and a reporter said somewhat rightly. Well, how can you talk about the Medicaid cuts? You don't know what's in it. And I was like, well, this is the devious ingeniousness of this ridiculous strategy, which is that you can't criticize the thing because, like, well, you don't know there are but, Medicaid cuts. But I mean, I, I don't think you just follow power and try to figure out what they're doing behind closed doors. There is a level of activism in this country, for example, around single payer, around Medicare for all. And this is the time, there's this window where people are deeply interested Definitely. in healthcare. Mm -hmm. So you bring up these issues. Right. When was the last time you saw an advocate of single payer on television? And yet- They've been oh, on my show. Yeah, no, I, I, <laughs> no, but I say recently- How did the block, did that, did the block do well? Figure out what power is doing between the Democrats and the Republicans. Have these discussions. When those kind of, um, when those kind of positions are put forward, most people actually agree. And what counts is the drumbeat coverage, right. the regular coverage of including people who expand the debate. I mean, when you're covering war, you don't just have a colonel on who feels that you should you know, put boots on the ground and a general who says, just bomb. What about the person who says, let's not attack at all? And this should be absolute um, level of debate in everything we do, and certainly on healthcare. Almost never, I mean, Chris is, an, is really an exception. Almost never, and, and I'm not talking Fox, I'm talking about MSNBC and CNN. Do they bring on a person who is an advocate of single payer? And sure, have them debate why 23 million people should lose their health care now. Have one of those people up against an Obamacare person. You know, they don't even, um, it is absolutely critical that we bring out these views, and this is the perfect week to do that. The week when no one can figure out what's going on. Well, what about our pe what people are organizing on the ground? California is nearing a single-payer bill being passed by both um, yep. uh, you know, houses of the legislature, and this is extremely important, and almost no coverage in the national media. But when you do, people watch, people care. This is what they're engaging in in their communities. So we're with the philanthropic community today. And if we are 
at this moment of unprecedented engagement, or at least mm -hmm. high levels of engagement. Um, you know, I think it's worth thinking about in, in terms of practical steps, even. America has this, I think, unique tradition in the, in the world of um, expectation that uh, if you have wealth and if you have means, you give back in some way. You, you, you practice engagement in that way. Um, if, if you were advising a foundation here that has program areas that aren't explicitly focused on democracy building, but do can maybe channel engagement, right? What, what would you say to that organization to help them make a difference? I think it's really important to fund uh, models for media that are not, models for media and civic engagement that are not market dependent. And, and not, and I say market dependent, and I don't mean like, forget corporate, right? You can be independent and market dependent. <laughs> like I know a lot of independent media producers who are market dependent. They know exactly how many subscribers they have and how many view, YouTube views they got yesterday, right? So like, like creating models that produce debate, reported coverage, policy particularly, state house and local coverage, engagement around those issues that is not, that is insulated from all of these incentives um, is I think really crucial. And I think like it's so hard to scale and get, even in a city like New York, I mean, mm -hmm. um, that, but there are so many places where people don't have what used to exist. Like just the, like what is my mayor doing? What is my governor doing? I mean. There's states that have one paper, basically, like for the whole state. <laughs> it's like, and maybe they have two state house reporters. So the, the the I and I also think it's really important to get past this kind of like to get past that polarization and the sort of like these sort of framing is that like you got the situation where oh great like I'm getting my news about Oklahoma from a Vassar grad who went to Dalton, like awesome. <laughs> I mean, no offense to Vassar grads that went to Dalton. I'm sure there's a few in the room, but, <laughs> but, but like, you want like someone from Oklahoma reporting on the news about Oklahoma. You want someone from the South Side of Chicago reporting on the South Side of Chicago, and et cetera, et cetera. And so, building, I think that it really is like this is a place where like there there is a real need for building models and not just like oh, writing a check, but actually building sustainable models that produce editorial decisions and, and newsrooms and investigative reporting and, and debate and, and events around stuff, sponsoring city council debates. Mm -hmm. Like that's a crazy idea. Like who's gonna sponsor a city council debate? Just about, there should be city council debates. There should be debates between local prosecutors that are running for races, right? Like all of this stuff that, that there used to be a lot more, frankly, institutional capacity to to promote is a lot of it's gone, and it's easy, I think, to lose sight of that in New York because it's hung on much better here than in other places with lower numbers of people, frankly, where the where the math doesn't work in the same way. But but that to me is like just a hugely important thing that that philanthropy can do is is investing in models to produce that kind of reporting, civic engagement, discourse in this sort of entire sphere that has been largely eviscerated. Right. I mean, supporting independent media is just absolutely critical, local and independent media. I mean, we haven't even talked about citizen and non-citizen journalism, people picking up their cell phones. And I mean, the hunger for these kind of images and how they've changed everything, because you didn't just get then the what the state, what the police, what the authorities were saying about an incident. You actually show this, and all too often the media in this country use the, um, you know, those in power's version of a story. And now this has burst that right open. And at the same time, really empowered young people to get out there and really open their eyes and show the world what they're seeing as well. So it's really exciting at every single level, the idea that young people are looking at journalism and saying, God, I have seen this in my community. I don't see it reflected other p places. I really want to document this. Um, and you know, whether someone is a formal journalist or a citizen um, journalist or a non-citizen journalist showing what's happening is really important and supporting uh, media outlets that are growing, that are new, that are there also, that, um, you know, just bring out this whole 
other set of voices that I really do think are the majority of people in this country. It's not, you got to just hear this fringe. I think people who care about war and peace, about the growing inequality in this country, about racial injustice, about LGBTQ rights, about climate change are not a fringe minority, not even a silent majority, but the silenced majority silenced by the corporate media, which is why we have to take it back and why young people are so engaged right now. I, I would also note, though, just in terms of the category of independent media, like that includes Infowars. Like, inf like, like the independent media is a big thing that has people like, and citizen journalism, like I've watched videos of people who are like citizen journalists going up to the Comet Pizzeria in Washington, DC to mm -hmm. crack the case. I mean, no, seriously. And like, right. that is a very- so you have to decide what you want to <laughs> That support. is a very successful yeah. enterprise yeah. that is giving voice to people yeah. that felt they didn't yeah. have a voice before. Right. As are white supremacist podcasts, which are popping up left and right, which the corporate media wouldn't run. Right, like the, we should be clear about the ter the totality of the terrain here mm -hmm. that has been opened up mm -hmm. um, is amazing in some ways, but also like super complicated when you when you when you when you get out into what is actually happening there. I mean, I have been somewhat obsessed recently with the growth of of white supremacist media and alt right media, and it is exploding. It is exploding on YouTube. There are um, there are people that are getting millions of views uh, on on YouTube talking to teenagers basically who are essentially Nazis. Um, and they, 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 have, they, have, they have crossed through the filter, right? They have, one of the biggest YouTube stars got in trouble because he was making anti-Semitic jokes. So it turns out this guy who'd been like getting 50 million views like had like totally odious views about the Jews. Um, but that's the, that, you know, that terrain is really fascinating and rugged. And, and again, like any ecosystem has all these different kind of species in it. Mm -hmm. And the question about what what to fund and how to find some some, you know, funding things that are that have a sort of vision for the kind of civic good, I think is mm -hmm. important. not that I don't think anyone in this room is going to be like signing up to fund, uh, you know, the next alt right podcast. But I don't know. Well, so on that note, we have a few audience questions. Um, how is the news media adapting to a paradigm of fake news and rapid distribution? I mean, I don't know. I, I think one of the ironies of one of the ironies of the age in this rapid <coughs> distribution is that um, when you talk about in, independent producers, like so you were talking about the Facebook video, right? So. There are these platforms that are total monopoly platforms that are producing the possibility of tremendous independent reach, right? So the the video of Philando Castile's death, which was taken by his girlfriend, uh, got millions of views because it was posted where? Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. So that was mediated through the largest media company in the world, which is a monopoly enterprise mm -hmm. without question, right? Facebook and YouTube, as these platforms for independent channels of distribution, have unbelievable power. Mm. And there is a complete, I think people have not reconciled with that. What if, what if, here's a fun thought experiment I think about all the time. <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg decides to run for president, and every Facebook news feed in America gets lots of stuff about Mark Zuckerberg every day. Right. Why can't that not? Why can that not happen? Well, there has to be a whole discussion about, um, you know, challenging from Google to Facebook these monopolies. It's not only that they have massive reach, but the level of information they have about each and every one of you is just massive, and that has to be discussed and debated. Even if they'll shut it down on those platforms, if you well, do that's it. right. So, so well, the thing about fake news, right, is that like to me, <laughs> fake news is a classic example of a, a negative externality. It's essentially the pollution that the factory puts in the water, mm -hmm. right? Which is that like Facebook get, makes money off of this business model where that people are gaming. Like Facebook makes money off it, right? Like so if you set up a site and you say, here's you know Denzel Washington endorsed Donald Trump, which is like my favorite fake news story of the last cycle, because like, I don't know, maybe he did. It's not, it's not like some, it's not crazy, right? It's not like, it's not like there's a child sex ring in a pizza parlor on Connecticut <laughs> Avenue. It's like, I don't know, maybe Denzel, Endorse Donald Trump. I don't know his politics, but that you know the people that are setting up these sort of content mills and all this stuff and the entire ecosystem that's developed from it. The 
the perspective of these sort of monopoly platforms with Facebook and YouTube is that like we don't have any responsibility for that. At some level, that's good, right? Like, do we want Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg to start reaching into the bowels of editorial control and being like, no, we're not showing Democracy Now's uh, 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 footage from Dakota Access Pipeline because we got a injunction letter. Violent. Right, exactly. It's too violent. Like, we certainly don't want that, right? But like, there's other stuff that maybe we don't want them posting. So there's this real question, like that the entire ecosystem that's been built up right now that is giving people this unprecedented individual reach, the Philando Castile video, is based on massive monopoly power that is entirely unaccountable. Facebook could do whatever they want. Tomorrow, tomorrow, Facebook could open up the largest news room in the world. Tomorrow, they could start Facebook news and 200 million people in the country would be watching Facebook video because they control what's in your newsfeed. They could do that tomorrow. The, the trust, the trust issues, they, they don't seem to touch Facebook as much. I mean, there's tremendous distrust and lack of confidence in the media, in the courts, in the scientific community, in government. Um, but everybody still feels pretty warm and fuzzy toward Facebook because you can see your friend's baby pictures, totally. which, you know, you can understand to a point, but um, but that power goes a little bit unchecked and I think that's, to me, this is sort of the next frontier, right. particularly with YouTube and Facebook, because they've become, the, their audiences are massive, and they have unbelievable monopoly power, and like at some point that's going to... Right. Okay. This is a nice positive question. Well, sort of. Uh, the majority of current political ads in France are positive. I want to do this. I will help do that. Sounds nice. Uh, can we in the U.S. get to that type of political dialogue? Not the mudslinging, and if so, how? You have two minutes. I don't know. I mean, uh, I think negativity is underrated. I mean, <laughs> I mean, great. Marine Le Pen is running positive ads. Like, <laughs> I, 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 I think I, I am. I have. I think negativity is fine. I really do. Like, I, th I think like. Politics is high stakes, it's it's conflict, it's necessarily conflict, people fight. I've actually been feeling this way and saying this on my show after this just unspeakably horrifying shooting uh, that happened this week, which is just almost incomprehensible in it, its monstrousness, and also what those two Capitol Police officers saved us all from. Because imagine 12 body bags being carted off that field of Republican members of the United States Congress, and then imagine how era-defining that would have been. Mm -hmm. So they saved everyone from that. They saved the individual lives there and the entire society from something cataclysmic. But And also, the, let's not forget that three people were actually killed at the UPS facility right. in San Francisco within yeah. a few hours of what happened there, that horrific shooting in Alexandria. And we have to, I mean, I watched the networks. There was all, except if you watched the zipper, you know almost nothing about what happened in San Francisco, and those people died. Yep. And it shows what people value. I mean, yep. both are horrific. In this case, but people died. Why don't we know more about this? And then you extend that to war. Uh, we know all about Manchester. I wrote a column um, last week that said we should use Manchester as the model for media coverage. All these kids who were killed, who were injured, we know their names, their family members, their parents. We heard their mothers. Yep. We need to use that same model. When what happened in Afghanistan last week, 150 people were killed in a terrorist explosion in the middle of Kabul. We need to know their names. And then people will be making very different decisions, whether it's Manchester, whether it's Yemen from a U.S. drone strike. We have to personalize things. I actually grew up on soap operas. And... It's not that, you know, so many people identified with women in evening gowns in the middle of the day drinking, but at least <laughs> it wasn't people at that time at least killing each other. You were following family dramas. Right. And if you use that same model to follow the dramas of people um, in their communities, very real um, life stories, people get addicted. People are intensely interested. We have just three more minutes. Um, I think just to finish the point, I, I think you don't have to tone down rhetoric. Basically, I think politics is a fight and it's fine to fight. That's my general feeling. <laughs> I mean, you shouldn't incite violence, obviously, and you shouldn't right. dehumanize other human beings. And you just have to open up that debate to right, show yeah. the true diversity of yeah. views and options there. So let me close with one last question, which I think might enable us to also think about a little takeaway. Um, in the current climate, what do you envision the role of research and its findings can be in 
in civic media dialogues and in fostering civic participation. Uh, Real news as opposed to fake news. Yeah, I mean, I think good data is always good. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I, I like data. I'm, I'm a very data-driven person. Um, there's a lot of terrible data in the industry I work in, which is a real problem. Garbage in, garbage out. Um, so I actually think that, like, what, to be honest, actually, I think what, what Amy's saying is really um, key, right? So the idea of, of actually having good measures for what people are actually interested in as opposed to what we think they're interested in, like, is really useful. That's a really useful metric. It's a useful metric for me, right? Um, and for everyone. I think it would be a useful metric for newsrooms, right? Like, to find ways to measure, like, oh, wow, there's actually a huge amount of engagement on the climate summit. There's a huge amount of engagement. Um, and again, you get back to the problem that the places that could aggregate that are the monopoly enterprises like Facebook, <laughs> which can tell you. Um, but but I do think that understanding that would be really helpful. It's also not just about the facts, it's about who's telling the stories. People are engaged by other people right. telling their own stories. And I just want to say, though, I think in this period, in this era of Trump, um, where he, you know, viciously attacks the media, I have been really shocked by this. I even hesitate to say it out loud. If he stopped for like a week attacking the media, the establishment media reflexively protects the establishment. And I think they would have wrapped themselves around him as well, except that they have to defensively defend themselves because he is so directly attacking them. And it's mattered. You know, Pete, do you see the media standing up saying, you know, the media is essential to the functioning of a democratic society. But when it comes to war, because even in this period, um, when it comes to the U.S. Um, engaging in military action, still the media circles the wagons around the White House. When was it that they said Donald Trump became president? When he bombed the air base in Syria? When he dropped the largest non-nuclear bomb in the world ever on Afghanistan? I mean, the Moab, the mother of all bombs, right? It was developed under Bush. He didn't dare do it. President Obama didn't do it. But Trump, within a few weeks, he drops this bomb. So it's here that the media fall short. Um, it, and that's, we need the media to be ever more independent when it comes to war. You know, I think what we need the media to do right now is to provide static, the dictionary definition of static. Criticism, opposition, unwanted interference. We need a media that covers power, not covers for power. We need a media that is the fourth estate, not for the state. And we need a media that covers the movements that create static and make history. I sort of feel like you are a one woman riot. <laughs> Well said. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think that was a heartfelt thanks for all of you for an outstanding panel. And I want to thank everybody who has spoken today from our first panel, our Phil talkers, through this last panel. It has been an incredibly thought provoking conversation. And I also think it's been a call to action. And we all know that we have work to do. And Philanthropy New York, as your organization, stands ready to help us as we go forward into this next year, taking the conversations, the suggestions, um, and the, the big issues that have been touched upon today. We stand ready to continue the conversation on all fronts, both through programming and supporting the work that you do. So one more round of thanks for the panel. And just before we all head out to lunch, I would love to have a round of thanks for the Philanthropy New York staff who put on today's program. Michael. Um, and they're all wearing that little blue badge, so feel free to say thank you and, and chat with folks. And now let's go to lunch. And thank you, J.P. Morgan yeah. Chase. It is on the 12th floor, and there are staff who will guide you to the right elevators and get you upstairs. Um, and we look forward to continuing the conversation there. Thank you. <laughs>